We've got so much that we bring in today. Questions, burdens, struggles, victories and joys. And as you sit down, I want you to set those on the ground. So find your seat and set those on the ground. Now, I don't know what questions you're bringing today. A lot of us just would like to be happy. We'd like, you know, our kid to just do fill in the blank. Or we'd like our parents to just do fill in the blank. Right? Maybe it's a position that we want, a certain level of income that we want, a house, a car. There are things we're doing where we're wanting to find happiness in life. And I'm doing a lot of thinking about happiness. I want you to be praying about that. Because beginning on Easter Sunday, I'm going to start a new short series that looks at relationships and looks at them in a very practical way. So be praying about that. Today, the question you might be asking is, how is it that I actually live with God? So maybe those things that I said about pursuing happiness in terms of a car or some level of income or some relationship fix that you want. That may not be what you're seeking. You're just like, just tell me how in the world I live my life with God. Now, I can tell you, today I'm not going to put a period in it. I'm not going to be able to provide that sum total answer for you. But we're going to go on a journey that points us in the direction of living our lives with God. And that direction is one that is guided by Jesus. A lot of times people will ask me, hey, you know, where do I start? I want to, I want to do this life with God thing. Where can I go? And I'll often suggest to pick up Luke Acts, the Gospel of Luke and his part two volume Acts. Now, it's a rather lengthy thing, not, not in terms of book standards, but in terms of the New Testament, it provides a great insight to the journey of Jesus through this life and the journey of the spread of the church away as Jesus had left. You see, kind of the way that it lays out is that you've got the Gospel of Luke where Jesus is metaphorically moving towards his death. Everything gets pointed in Luke towards Jerusalem, towards his death. And then in Acts, it takes a turn and everything begins to move away from Jerusalem. Everything spreads out from Jerusalem as this word, this message, this Spirit of God spreads out to all the earth. Now, when I look at my life, and whenever you probably think about your own life, and look at Luke and Acts, what's described there seems very different from the way that we live our lives. And I mean that very straightforwardly. If you look in Luke and you see how Jesus acted, or if you look in Acts and you see how the people of God acted, everything is dependent upon God. They are relying and trusting upon God, nights in prayer, coming together unsure of what to do next, but putting their belief and their trust fully in God. And so it's a completely different way of life than I think most of us live. To really think in terms of depending entirely upon God, of letting seeking the Spirit be all that we're about, or letting following Jesus be the person that we sit down with, just Jesus who helps guide us through every decision, it's a far cry from the way that we live our life. And so my suggestion of you reading Luke Acts will drive you into taking a look at this pivot point story in human history where Jesus arrives. He arrives bringing his life as an example for everyone. And here in, in Luke, the message that Jesus was about was about preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. In fact, it's right here in Luke 4, 43. I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities, for that is the purpose that I was sent. And in Luke 9, 1 and 2, it's what he tells his followers to do as well, that they're to proclaim the message that God reigns and that the kingdom of God has come near Sounds a lot like our mission, if you think about it. Oh yeah, we haven't talked about it in a while, right? Our mission at first is what? Follow Jesus, that's exactly right. And it's all about being with Jesus, doing what Jesus did, saying the things that Jesus said, like this message of the arrival of the kingdom of God, and 
going where Jesus leads. That's our mission. That's what we're about in this world. And Acts lays out for us in a neat and tidy way for this mission. Here's how it lays out. And it's the way I want to attack it. I want to tell you three stories from Acts, and it's going to be from each one of these three categories of the outline of the book. I'm kind of wiping my forehead in relief that I only have one whole book to look at. Those of you that have been with us on this journey of the story know that we're going through the entire Scripture in 12 weeks. Really just 10 weeks. Because the last week I'm going to tell the whole story in one. Well, today we get one. We get the story of Acts. And it starts out in chapter 1 through verse 8 telling about the coming of the Spirit on the Jews. About this mission where what they're supposed to do is to, to wait for the coming of the Spirit. The second phase from chapter 8, verse 4 through the end of chapter 12 is about the coming of the Spirit on all people. And the last section, from chapter 13 through the end of the, le- of the, end of the book in 28, is about the coming of the good news and the spread of the Spirit to the ends of the earth. Now the book, if you look in, in your Bibles, you'll probably see that it says, The Acts of the Apostles. And that's a pretty good title. It it gets at that there are apostles and they are acting. But there's really only two main apostles that get talked about. A lot of names, but two biggies, Peter and Paul. And if you look really close, it's not really the acts of the apostles so much as it is the acts of the Holy Spirit. Working through Peter and Paul, working through many of the named apostles, working through a lot of unnamed and named minor characters where the Holy Spirit is spreading out to the ends of the earth. Okay, well, that's the outline. Let me tell you the three stories. Story number one is the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the Jews. Luke and Acts end and begin in the same place. So Luke ends with Jesus ascending into heaven, and that's exactly where Acts picks up. It's kind of strange to me because... Jesus has just shocked the world and not only gone to his death willingly, but he's been resurrected from the dead. He's back. He's appearing to people. It's fantastic. And yet in this appearance, uh, he, he leaves. He ascends into heaven. And I just have to sit back and scratch my head and say, why would he leave? Why leave? He's just got back. Why are you going away? And the strange thing is, uh, not only that he has been appearing, but who it is that he appears to. He appears to the apostles and various disciples, but I I wonder, why didn't he appear to Pilate? Wouldn't that have been a good idea? Hey, Pilate, what's up, man? Oh, I thought I I killed you. Or to, to appear to the Jewish religious authorities that saw his death and put that forward. And if he just appeared to them, wouldn't that be exciting? Because then he'd have like full-blown proof we could establish the kingdom right here and now in this earthly place. And yet, that's not what he does. Everyone's waiting for him to establish it. He's resurrected, and it's not that kind of a kingdom. Instead, the Holy Spirit is what's promised. So he comes back to these apostles and he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, we're ready. We're seeing a living dead person. And he says, I want you to go and wait in Jerusalem. Wait. Come on now. Who, who wants to wait when you're charged up and ready to go to share this message? Wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Wait for the presence of God to fill you. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you. Wait for this witness to flow through your lives. And so, Pentecost... In the middle of this celebration of the Feast of Weeks, a time when Jews would celebrate the coming of the Torah, they're in this 50-day period of waiting. A time when the Holy Spirit falls on a group of Jews in Acts 1 and 2, and it comes like a wind. It comes like the representation of tongues of fire over their head. It's a powerful moment where everyone can hear their language. The people are speaking in languages that they're untrained in. It's an amazing time. It's a Joel 2 time. The prophet Joel predicted a time 
when the Holy Spirit of God would fall upon everyone, men, women, your sons, your daughters, your female slaves, and your male slaves. So everybody, not just those inside the kingdom of God, not just the Jews, but also everyone. And Joel 2 shows up in Acts 2, and this same message is said that those who will call upon the name of the Lord, everyone, will be saved. And so we find that in this amazing event, the Spirit of God is not restricted to Jesus. It's not limited to just living inside of Jesus. It's poured out on all people, of all genders, all racial backgrounds, everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. The Holy Spirit, from this first story we see, is a gift. Well, that's, that's story number one. The second story moves past the Holy Spirit just falling on a group of Jews and goes to another group. In this group, you've got Cornelius, and Cornelius is an Italian. He's an Italian Roman centurion. He's over a lot of, a lot of men, and he has also the designation of being a God-fearer. All right, what's a God-fearer? Well, as a Gentile, as a non-Jew, he was still a worshiper of Yahweh. And he went to pretty much the full extent. He would worship with a lot of the food laws, not all of them. Worship with most of the festivals, but not all of them. And maybe not go to the full length of the law of going under the knife, if you know what I mean, to practice circumcision. So he was a God-fearer. Cornelius has a vision. And the vision says, I want you to go to a Jew named Peter. And you'll know him because he's staying in the house of a Gentile, Simon the Tanner. All right, now this is a strange setup because Jews are not supposed to live in the house with another non-Jew. They're certainly not supposed to live in the house of a tanner, someone that cuts animals and skins them. That makes them doubly, ritually unclean. But Cornelius, this Italian Roman centurion, sends a couple men to go find Peter. Well, here's Peter. Peter, the, the apostle, who is in kind of an uncomfortable cultural immersion experience, if you will. He's, as a Jew, staying in this Gentile uh, part of town, which God had encouraged him to do, and he's still trying to process it. In fact, it's time for lunch, and Peter kind of conks out. You know how this happens, you know, probably about this time, feeling a little hungry. And he falls asleep, and I don't know if he's picking up the, the smell of, of sausage or some other meats, some non-Jewish meats in the air, and he gets hungry, and he has this dream of a, a sheet, like a picnic sheet, coming down with all of these various meats saying, take Peter and eat. Peter's a pretty good guy, because even in his dreams, he's going to follow the rules. How about that? So, oh, no, no, the, I've never had any of these. I'm a Jew, I don't eat these. Picnic sheet goes into the heavens. Comes back down again, same thing, all the meats. Peter, take and eat what God has declared clean, you must not declare unclean. Peter's like, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a good Jew. I know I'm staying in the house of a Gentile and they skin meat and I'm smelling all this food, but I'm a good Jew. No, I'm not going to do it. Three times he has this vision. I don't know if he's awakened, but there's a knock at the door and here's Cornelius' men. And they say, hey, Peter, you're supposed to come with us. And Peter goes into the house of yet another Gentile, Cornelius. And he begins to see what God is trying to tell him by telling him to go into Simon the Tanner's house, to go into the Gentile side of town, to go and be with Cornelius. And it's at that moment that the Holy Spirit of God falls upon all of these Gentile God-fearing believers. That's amazing. Now, we tend to think about our practice of following Christ in very orderly, boxy ways. Like, you believe, and then you get baptized, and then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We think of that, but here in this moment, they get the Holy Spirit, and the order is all mixed up. And they say, well, I guess we need to be baptized. They're taking care of what they need to do. In this moment, when God is showing Peter, I now understand there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. In this moment, in this time, it leaves him dumbfounded and yet he's able to speak about what God is calling. That the restriction of focusing just in on the Jews 
and this focus on this ritual act of circumcision is not going to be the focus. Instead, what's going to be the focus is the fruit of the person's life and to see that the Holy Spirit is not just a gift given, like the first story said, but it's a gift given to all people. It's available to all. Which brings us to the third story. So you have some strange events like this, and now the church has to deal with it at kind of a worldwide level. Paul and Barnabas run into a group of Judaizers. These are Christians who are Jews who really feel like you could, should still keep following the Jewish law. And so it, it brings the church to a crisis. What do we do? What are we supposed to, to do with this new information about circumcision and what we do with the Gentiles? How do we incorporate these pagan people that have not been following all the rituals? And so they have a council. And sure enough, it's Peter that steps forward to speak. Peter, who saw with his own eyes what happened in Acts 1 and 2 when the Holy Spirit falls on them. Peter, who saw with his own eyes Cornelius and his whole household be given the Holy Spirit even before they were baptized. And Peter steps forward and says, look, God is not a respecter of persons. This is not what it's all about. In, in Acts chapter 15, verse 17, that's what it's all about. These are people who are seeking God. And so the Spirit is not about this external ritual. And so the council gets together. We often don't think about this, but a council of elders and apostles that says, we can now see that circumcision is not the way to go. That instead, if people will walk away from idolatry, walk away from the illicit sex of those pagan practices, if they will live full of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is not just a gift given. It's a gift given to all people, and it's not done so out of this ritual of circumcision. This is a stunning move. And it's how Acts progresses forward. The book ends in chapter 28 with Paul, the adopted apostle, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And I don't want you to just see this verse. If you'll flip to Acts chapter 28 and look at that final verse, verse 31. It's just a short one. Paul is there for two years. Verse 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So what Paul preaches is what Jesus preached. It's that God reigns, that the kingdom, the reign of God has come. And it's arrived through the Lord Jesus Christ, the King who is Lord, which is Jesus and that allows Paul to be bold and to have no hindrance. He drops down all the walls and all the barriers and witnesses to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you think about how this story connects with our own story, the Spirit of God has been moving since the beginning of time. In fact, it probably would be an interesting study all on its own to track how God's Spirit shows up through the entirety of Scripture. Just think about it. When God hovered as a Spirit over the waters of the deep in Genesis 1. When God breathes into Adam and to Eve, giving life to humanity. When God promises through the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 that the time is coming when He would pour out His Spirit on all people. Everyone, from the least to the greatest. And they would have life and guidance through the Holy Spirit of God. To the point where Jesus, in His baptism, the Holy Spirit descends upon Him. The voice announces, This is My Son, the Beloved. With Him I'm well pleased. And in Acts 2 that we just looked at, where the Holy Spirit is poured out on people. The Spirit of God has been coming from the beginning. A spirit that, as Galatians tells us in Galatians 3.28, is not about Jew or Gentile. It's not about male or female or slave or free. But it is about the Holy Spirit of God coming upon us. And us living out the fruit of that spirit, like Galatians 5 points out. 
That's where, when we think about our own lives, of inviting God to live with us, maybe a passage like 2 Corinthians 3.18 is a good one for us to look at. Where we're looking through this mirror darkly at Christ. Where we are being transformed from one degree of glory into another, into the image and likeness of Christ. Well, I want to take one more pass at trying to take this home a little bit deeper. And I want to do so with an older movie, and I'm going to let the clip be playing in the background as I talk about what's happening. You probably remember me talking about the movie Stranger Than Fiction. One of Will Ferrell's movies, I think it's his best one. He's a tax man. And in this scene, he's coming to an English professor who's played by Dustin Hoffman. Well, here's the problem that Harold has run into. He has heard a voice in his head that's an author narrating his life clearer and with a better vocabulary. And it's troubling to him. And he goes to this English professor for help, asking the English professor to help him figure out what this story is or how he could get in touch with the author. And so Dustin Hoffman's character gets him in touch with the author who always writes tragedies and the main character always dies. So you can see why Harold is a little bit upset. And so he gives, in this scene, the, the script to Dustin Hoffman to let Dustin kind of find some way to get him out of this mess, to help him approach this author and cancel the story. And what you're seeing right now is Dustin Hoffman saying to Harold, Harold, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to die. It's her greatest story. It's her masterpiece. And it just doesn't make sense if you don't die. And Harold, in kind of true Will Ferrell form, says, I don't want to die. It's not very good timing. I'm just starting to find happiness in my life. And so Harold must wrestle with what he's going to do. Now, for me, I see these characters as representatives of the Trinity. Now, I don't know if the, the writer of this movie thought that, but Dustin Hoffman in this way, for me, portrays God. Harold Crick the tax person who's the main character in the story, who's being told that he has to die, for me, represents Jesus as a Christ figure. And the Holy Spirit is this author who's out there writing this story who has to deal with the trauma of a changed story. Now, in the case of the movie, Stranger Than Fiction, it throws the author for a loop. Because originally, she was writing a story about a man who died and didn't know that he was going to die. And now, because she's figured out that this person is a real person and that she holds his life in her hands, the story's changed because this is now about a man who is willingly facing his own death, which is a different story entirely. An amazing movie. Amazing things are hidden within stories like this that give us something to talk about. And the reason I bring it up is to make us think about our own life. How do we live with God? What does that look like? These stories, a movie, can seem so far away, but how is it that you and I begin to live with God? Just this week, I read a line from a guy named Brian Bantam. Don't know him, he's a theology professor. But this line grabbed a hold of me and grabbed my attention because he says that he wants to have wonder for the one who is with me but who is not me. Wonder for the one who is with me but who is not me. As you go through your life, you might have this sense that you're not alone. That you're going through your life in partnership with another. And it's not that God collapses into us. We're, we're not God. We never will be. But the God who made you, the God who made everything that we can see and everything that we can't see, wants to live your life with you, in partnership with you. And the story of Scripture is in some way a story of God not only making this world, but coming and entering this world and trying to show you how you can live connected to God. There's much to think about. I told you I wouldn't be putting the period because you're writing this story of what it is to live your life with God, that you're not alone, that your own happiness is 
beginning to be tied to something greater than yourself. And so today, just like we released from our hands the things that we concern, the things that are questions that we have, I'd like us to open up our hands again and to return to God in prayer as we close. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, maker of each one of us, we thank you. We thank you, God, that you made us. We thank you, God, that you love each one of us. And we're in awe, God, that you want to live within us. And we welcome your spirit. We welcome your presence in our life, that we will make decisions that are in step with the spirit, that we will follow arm in arm with Jesus, and that we will recognize that we have an eternal God who cares very deeply for us. We pray this through Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.